So I'll now be delighted to welcome on stage a few people. Uh, the first will be J.D. Michaels, who is the uh, EVP, the Director of Creative Engineering, and Co-Director of Diversity for BBDO in New York. So J.D., please welcome. Next, I'm inviting Gregory Anderson. Please join us. He is the, the senior VFX supervisor, visual effects supervisor, uh, and head of the studio for Fuse FX in New York. Thank you so much for being here. And finally, I'm very happy to welcome Professor Ama Ido, uh, who is right here at MIT with us. Uh, she's also a professor with me alongside uh, me on the faculty, and she is coming from a professor of African studies. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure to be with you all today, and we're going to reflect on the topic of Afrofuturism. We're going to take quite a broad definition. In one hand, we'll be talking about the role of culture, popular cultural artifacts like movies. But I think more importantly, we'll be asking what it means for our community to help define the future we want to see uh, for our children and our children's children, and what have been some of the lessons we can take from history, as well as some of the uh, key opportunities we take right now. If you don't indulge me, I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce what I do here at the Media Lab as a way to, to illustrate. So if you can bring up the first set of slides, that'd be excellent. I'll set the stage with a few ideas, both from my personal experience as well as from my research. As Joey mentioned, uh, the mission statement from my team here at MIT Media Lab is that we are advancing justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. So the group is called Space Enabled. And it was inspired by a long series of questions I had to answer as I studied aerospace engineering here at the MIT Media Lab, well, not at the Media Lab, but at actually at the engineering community uh, in the aerospace uh, engineering department. Uh, what turns out to be true now is that the world is engaged in a very important challenge that is defined partly by what we see on the screen, which is the 17 global goals for sustainable development. This is a, a very helpful summary of the key questions that face our global community. But of course, it particularly affects people of color, people who live near the equatorial regions of the world, because climate change means that the environmental challenges and issues of access to food and water and energy are particularly affecting those who have experienced colonization. They are the ones who are the most disadvantaged in addressing these challenges. So when people say there are countries who are developing, what they should be saying is there are countries who have experienced a lot of uh, challenges due to colonization, and therefore these are a particular challenge for them. But of course, here in the United States, we are not shining stars in all these areas yet either. So every country is working to improve their own metrics in these 17 areas. In my particular area, I've been asking since I was a freshman here at MIT, how can I, as somebody who cares about space technology, be a part of this activity and contribute my own personal skills in space engineering to this activity? And here at the Media Lab, my answer is that I bring together people across these six areas of design thinking and art, of social science, especially economics, history, anthropology. And we asked then how we combine that with the technical pieces of uh, building satellites, doing satellite engineering, uh, using complex systems modeling, and computer science. And all of that comes together to actually make uh, real life solutions, but in partnership with leaders who are doing development. So our team works on development. We don't, we don't start development projects. We learn from development leaders who are already excellent in their work. And we ask, how can we join you and be part of the vision you're trying to create with our tools? And well, our key message is that we have these six technologies from space that already exist, but they're not designed effectively in a way that helps create the future we want. We need to redesign them, change the technology around so it actually meets needs. This means we can use satellites to observe the Earth and bring connectivity and also for positioning information. We invent all kinds of things to go to space. And then the question becomes, can those inventions be redesigned in a social context and used in a way that actually meets needs on Earth? Also, what's exciting is around the world, you're seeing more and more involvement of every country and every region in fundamental research. Some people ask me, oh, why should a country spend money on astrophysics research when they are perhaps uh, addressing issues of poverty? But I, I say, for every country, of course, it's up to them, but it's also fundamentally part of what it means to be a country, to include opportunities for children of every background to grow up and say, I don't want to be an astrophysicist. This should be a, a basic right of all kids, right? So you see, actually, no, I, I, that's quite serious, that if a kid grows up where they think that they cannot stay in their country and they, they cannot study this topic, this is basically unfair, it's unjust. So for me, justice means that in the future, every kid will grow up knowing that they can be a space engineer or an astronomer, and that they can do it as part of a global community, but also from their home. And so right now, for example, in Africa, you're seeing eight countries engaging and working together on the square kilometer array. Has anyone heard of the SKA? 
It's going to be the largest radio telescope ever. It'll be spread across two continents, partly in Africa, partly in Australia. But I've just come from Ghana, where I visited their first installation for this radio telescope. And kids growing up in Accra can look outside and see a very large dish and say, this is astronomy happening right in my country, and it's cutting edge. This is justice. So I have brought together a team of people from a variety of fields. I mentioned these six areas. So these graduate students are doing masters and PhD research, uh, helping me bring together these six fields of design, art, social science, complex system modeling, satellite engineering, and data science. I need all of their help so we can make these visions a reality. And of course, we seek an opportunity to create a multi-ethnic community in my research group. Just to say that what's happening now in the space community, and this is where the Afrofuturism comes in, is we're transitioning from an old way of thinking to a new way. I'm showing a beautiful, important satellite. It's one of the ones built by NASA and operated by our National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. It's one of our key weather satellites. It helps us predict the weather coming up. And it's very important, and of course, it's built in a traditionally and very effective way. It's expensive. It costs um, billions of dollars to go through the, the development of a series of these satellites that make sure we can find our major storms. But it's also um, the traditional way of doing satellites. What you're seeing today is an alternative way. It's less expensive and more accessible, and therefore more just. Uh, these are examples of what we call cube satellites, which are very small, and which can be built in a laboratory that's not nearly as expensive or complex uh, or uh, so much of a barrier compared to the traditional satellites. And so kids around the world can get involved with projects like these. You're seeing an example here of fourth graders who worked on a, a school project, and their satellite was actually launched to space by NASA. Now this means that it should no longer be true that any country would say, we cannot do space in our country. Actually, it's possible for every country to do this. This is justice. But there's still work to do to ask, what does it mean to design these satellites in a way that's particularly relevant to the needs of each community around the world, especially, in my interest, the community that's equatorially driven, and especially those who are post-colonial countries, especially in the African community. So I spend a lot of my time visiting countries in Africa that are starting space programs, learning from their approaches, and also asking how I can work with them. I was first inspired by NASA's work, and I had a chance to see a number of launches and to grow up with seeing the space shuttle program. And that's why I came to MIT to become a space engineer. I felt confident that I should be a part of this community, helping to make the future possible in terms of space exploration. But I also felt a tug because I felt if I did this full time, I wouldn't be contributing to the needs of, well, basically little girls around the world. I wanted to ask, how will they also have their life improve with this technology? At first, I didn't know, but I would take breaks from studying engineering to go travel to Kenya uh, once a year and just volunteer because that seemed like the right thing to do. But I kept asking, can I combine my interest in space and my interest in serving, especially in this case, young girls in Africa? And finally, I realized that actually Kenya has experts who already know how to use data from NASA satellites to inform the development of their country. And when I made that connection and saw examples of people collaborating between NASA and Kenya to make better decisions with data from space, then I said, oh, this is not a conflict. This is actually a job where I can work forever in this field of bringing together space and development. I gave the example in my lightning talk yesterday, of a project we're doing with an entrepreneurial company in Benin, where we're directly asking how to use satellite data to monitor an invasive plant. And they have a very innovative model of turning that into a business model. So it's exciting to see these leaders that we can follow. I just want to briefly highlight uh, what it means now for me to teach this topic here at the Media Lab, and what it means to uh, learn from our existing scholars, and then I'll learn from also from you. As we talk about Afrofuturism today, I actually start by looking backwards. And when I uh, talk about the benefit uh, of Professor Ibram Kendi, I have to now grab some props. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, there's a lot of books in my work these days, <laughs> which is great. I must be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so Ibram Kendi was here in, in May, and thank you to Joey also for helping us host him. Uh, he wrote this very large book, but uh, you all must read it. How many of you read Stamp from the beginning? Because this book is mandatory reading for all of my students, and it is a retelling of American history but allows us to ask, throughout each era of history and each key thought leader, uh, who was propagating the ideas about race, and were these ideas anti-racist? Mostly they weren't. <laughs> or were they assimilationist? Meaning, did they say, oh, the black people, well, they're not as good as us yet, but one day they could be. Or were they truly segregationist, saying, actually, people who are different, like the black people, uh, they're just never going to be as good as we are. Pass that around for reference. Uh, so my students who are engineers have to read this history because we need to have this very rigorous definition, first of the evidence of what's happened in our American history, but second, just for, just for the stage, I think, <laughs> but second to ask, um, you know, how can we use tools today to ask about our designs? Are they anti-racist or, in fact, perhaps assimilationist or segregationist? Uh, and I also want to highlight uh, the benefit. Actually, one of the only few people in the book that actually does anything anti-racist is Zora Neale Hurston. She's one of the first. We think of her work, especially in time uh, of the um, Harlem Renaissance, and ask, 
while the world was responding to minstrelsy, and this is one of the key forms of entertainment of the day, uh, we now instead see Zerona Hurston coming in, and instead, of course, of mocking black culture, she presents black culture in a very natural and just generous way. And it's one of our first examples of entertainment through concerts and through, through the plays funk, uh, of showing culture without filter and without judgment. So we build on her reference, then start looking at the future. I just briefly want to highlight, do you guys know who this is? Okay, some of you do, and because people often see Margot Lee and they don't realize what she did, and then they say, oh, but they saw Hidden Figures. <laughs> but Margot Lee, of course, is the historian who actually did the research that fed into the book. Let's, let's give the historian's credit for the work. So while well, people might say, oh, but black people weren't around to create this technology, but we were, we just didn't get credit for it at the time. And we want to give credit to the true engineers who were the ones that she was writing about. So again, we look backwards before we look forward, and the next point then is to ask, uh, who has been the, the authors helping us look forward as well? I, I briefly paused to highlight my aunt, who's one of the writers who I think of as bringing words, uh, especially to, to tell stories about young people uh, that look like us. Uh, so she writes books especially targeted toward the middle school and the high school age reader to tell our stories. And now I'll briefly highlight, from my own definition of Afrofuturism, some of the key thinkers that I'll refer to us to discuss. Uh, it includes, uh, of course, we have to mention Octavia Butler, who's long been uh, you know, a, a hero and a pillar in this area and somebody we can all build from. And then we also have some of the, the later voices that are come up later. Uh, so I want to highlight uh, the role and the influence to me personally. Do you all know who, who this is? <laughs> some of you are, are ready. Um, so this is Nichelle Nichols. And she played a powerful role in influencing as a, both an activist but also as an actor, right? So she played uh, Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek, on the original series. And so I, I was thankful to meet her on the day of the last shuttle launch. But then we had the chance, uh, more recently, <laughs> to celebrate. <laughs> I celebrated uh, Halloween this year. In honor of my new job, I felt it was important to say, whose shoulder am I building on today? So we'll, we'll touch on this idea of the role of movies and, and stories like Star Trek. And I want to say, of course, her role was, was pivotal, being the first black woman in a way to play this important technical role. But also, um, she was an activist by also fighting for her rights as an employee, actually, which I appreciate very much. I want to just highlight uh, another more recent voice, which is uh, Nedia Korfor. Is anyone reading Nedi? So she is a Nigerian-American author, and she writes stories about science fiction. She, some of them are, are actually happening in space. So one of her heroes is Benti, who has space travel adventures. And she is so smart that she can understand the basis of electronics just through her, her meditation on math and control forces with her hands. And these are stories that are now what I would consider Afrofuturism in the sense that they are telling a story about Africa and about the black community in space but not driven by, at all, the current dialogue around the role of, say, Europe and Africa. It's just a fresh story out of her imagination. So I want to put these forth as examples of what's been inspiring me, and then be able to ask each of you to share some things in response. So thank you all for indulging me. <laughs> Good. So I'm going to go through a few thoughts that allow you all both to introduce yourself further, but also uh, to tell us what you are thinking about in your own work on these issues. Uh, the overall thing I want to ask first is to give your own definition of Afrofuturism in the context of our discussion here and in your daily work, so you can explain what you're doing throughout your work, but also say how it fits into your activities. And give us a few minutes each on that, uh, and then we'll be able to come through and hear more detailed discussions as we go. So why don't you start, J.D.? Hi. Um, my name is J.D. Michaels. Again, I, I work at BBDO. We are a worldwide ad agency, uh, the one that Mad Men was based off of. Um, I worked with a gentleman there who retired uh, about two years ago um, at 84. Um, there's an episode in the very first episode of Mad Men. They say, hey, bbd and hired a colored ad exec. What do you think? And Don Draper goes, I think I'm glad I'm not that guy. Uh, the guy I worked with was that guy. Um, I am about the next guy. Uh, or the next and a half guy. So there's not a whole, once we all got in one elevator, that was fun. Um, so um, so um, that, uh, the, the issue with advertising is that we speak to everybody. We tell stories, and much of what your research is doing is interesting to me because we are a natural um, dovetailing of data, social science, and art. Um, and the trick with what we do is we speak to people who don't like us personally, who have maybe nothing to do with us personally and don't agree with us, but we need to understand them on a level to be effective with the advertising we put forward. So um, part of my job was creative engineering, which is finding out how to do crazy things that might get you arrested. <laughs> I know how to get an elephant in and out of Manhattan, that sort of thing. Um, the other part is 
The other part is diversity, which has been a word that has been kind of just very railroaded in one way. So the first thing I did to accept the job, I said I wouldn't accept it unless I got a chance to redefine it. Yeah. So my definition of diversity is, diversity is your unique combination of passions, what you love and you hate, experiences, where you've been, and choices, where you're going. And that's it. We're going to stop there. Because it's easier to get in a room and say, how many people grew up with a family that had dry turkey on Thanksgiving? Oh, do you see the laughing people? They know what gravy is. <laughs> that pulls people together no matter what you ask in a way that is much more effective both on my ROI for what I'm doing for my clients and also on a human level than saying, I need all black women between the ages of 28 and 35 to stand. So once I did that, um, I started to see a lot of the communications we had in a much different way and was able to hopefully be a lot more effective in what we do. Um, a piece I'm going to talk about and show, which starts my idea of Afrofuturism, um, is a piece we did for P&G that I got to be involved in called The Talk. Um, and so my view of Afrofuturism, to sum up, is that uh, for me, I just turned 52 last week, today is the future. This is, I'm on the other end of Afrofuturism. If it was a Q-tip, I'd be this end of the Q-tip now. Um, uh, and that this is the future and appreciating where Afrofuturism is going, for you people that are lucky enough to be younger, um, you really need to have the reference of where it's come from. Because I'm in a business that says new and improved a great deal, but that doesn't mean a lot if you don't know before what wasn't new or improved. It's hard to appreciate innovation over ignorance. <laughs> Thank you very much. We look forward, we'll hear a bit more on, and see more further visuals. Uh, let's go ahead and bring in Greg, have you share as well. Okay. Uh, hi. <clears throat> Sorry, it's a little loud. Uh, my name is Greg Anderson. Uh, I am a visual effects supervisor. Uh, what visual effects is, is uh, it's image making. And specifically, it's about creating and manipulating images and, and fooling the eye or changing what you think is believable. And so for me, um, and for my particular slant, uh, and I think why Black Panther was so effective is that uh, we, the, we were controlling the image. And I think um, as a filmmaker, controlling imagery uh, really is the root at sort of controlling or, or affecting culture uh, how we're perceived or how we perceive things. And so what was kind of fascinating for me as a, as a visual effects artist, seeing Black Panther was not the effects themselves, but they created a world, they created images where we were able to see ourselves in a different light. And I think that resonated uh, not just for black people around the world, but for the world, obviously, as it I think is the third highest grossing movie of all time. I think um, we were able, that, that film and other films like it uh, are able to sort of influence what we do by showing us sort of a different version of ourselves. And so it's not as if we've, you know, historically haven't had these sort of intellect or knowledge or experience or resources to do all these things, we're constantly bombarded with imagery that says we can't. And so Black Panther really, you know, kind of ignored all of that, created this sort of new lens to see ourselves. And it immediately, obviously resonated in a very big way. And so what I do every day is manipulate images. And it, it was a, not just manipulate, I mean, part of my job is to fool you, is to make you believe something that isn't real. Uh, and this is a very, very, it's a very powerful tool that, you know, it's like the notion of using your, your superpowers for good or using them for evil. <laughs> um, as an example, uh, if any of you guys saw Blade Runner, the new Blade Runner last year. So 
Blade Runner, that film won the Oscar for visual effects, um, mostly because there was a completely computer-generated human, and you probably didn't know it. And for visual effects, that's the holy grail, is creating believable uh, computer-generated faces and emotions that you buy. So in the movie, at, at, towards the end, Sean Young's character uh, from the original Blade Runner shows up. Obviously, Sean Young is in her 70s, if she's, I, I don't know, even if she's still alive. But she shows up as the way she appeared in the original Blade Runner, that she was completely computer generated. So, what does that mean for us? It's like, well, I think if we can, I think a lot of thought has to go into how that's going to affect uh, how we're perceived worldwide. I think particularly in relation to the internet and the sort of dispersion of information, and visual information that you, don't, you may not be able to believe. Like I'm consistently uh, watching imagery and looking at it through my own lens as an expert in visual effects and going, that's not real. They've, they changed that. And that's a really powerful thing. It, imagery and filmmaking, these kinds of things kind of affect how we think. And if you can't believe the images that are in front of you, it's, it's a pretty scary situation. So, um, but on the flip side, using it for good, we create these worlds that have never existed before, that we, that we believe in our hearts and souls, like this is real. And I think that's, that's what was really amazing to me about Black Panther and how now we're talking about Afrofuturism in a way that feels tangible. Because we just, we saw it. Mm -hmm. It's not real, but we saw it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's really interesting to me. Thank you, it's an excellent great transition. I really like that key point you're bringing in of you're creating something that isn't real, but then we ask the question, well, can we make it real because of the, the vision and the storytelling that's happened there? I want to transition, and we'll take a few minutes. Also, Professor Ido, I just have to pause and say it's lovely to be here with you. And I'm just thinking back to McCormick <laughs> when I was a freshman and first met you. And you were somebody who I could go to for advice and for a sense of grounding in this community. So thank you for that back then. And thank you for being here with us today. Well, I'm surprised I could be that for you because I felt clueless the entire time I was there. So, you know, I'm happy that all you had to do was, was, was fake it and just be there and, and show up, which is excellent. <laughs> Please share with us uh, your research vision and how that fits into this dialogue in whichever way you'd like. And whenever you're ready, the slides are ready to go. Okay. I figure out if I want to use the slides, but hi, everyone. Um, so I, I am an anthropologist by training, so my background is in anthropology and a discipline known as STS, Science and Technology Studies. Um, and I say that first because I'm going to be kind of the hopelessly analog and low-tech participant on this panel, I anticipate. Um, because what my work centers on is um, essentially the politics of knowledge production. So interrogating the very categories of science and technology and interrogating everything that we sort of um, associate with them, sort of like the narrative about the, the promise of science, science and technology and all of it, kind of taking, asking questions maybe two or three steps behind and being like, wait, who's, who's saying what these objects are and what they can do in the world and so on. Um, and so I work on this specifically within the context of African studies, um, which is not just, so African studies you can think of as studies of all things African, right, of culture in African locations. Um, the way I approach it is that my work focuses on the idea of Africa itself. So um, I'm West African, I'm Togolese, and I grew up across Togo, Zimbabwe in the US. Um, and for me, even while I lived in Togo as a child, I was always aware of the sense that um, real life happened somewhere else. 
Um, and that's crazy, because my family left Togo when I was nine, yet from a young age, that was already the way that I was seeing myself, my place in the world as an African. So the goal was to leave, essentially, right? Um, and so I've kind of been obsessed with that forever, so going from West Africa to Southern Africa, where for the first time I experienced, you know, first-hand racism, because Zimbabwe was a former settler colony with a white minority that lived there, and so, um, my, the idea of Africanness and blackness for me were very early, were intertwined very early, um, and have come to um, influence my work today. So um, when I think about Afrofuturism, the way that I take it first is as you know, a historical, sort of like an artistic and intellectual movement that's grounded in a particular history and a particular political project. So for me, Afrofuturism in its kind of original form is um, an American project, right? It's an African-American, it's a diasporic project that is centered or that, that's a political project with aims of black liberation, right? And that and black liberation imagined through the tools of technology and um, the arts. Um, and that draws from African history, African cultural practices, African artifacts, African imagery and all of that. But it's not inherently, I mean, it's not an African project, right? And I think, but that's okay, because um, now there's, you know, there can be questions about whether science fiction by African artists um, is Afrofuturism, for instance. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, that's up for, that's up for debate and for discussion. Maybe we can get to that. Um, but the, so I don't engage so much with Afrofuturism as I like, as I think about African futures and the idea of what does it mean to envision, like, what's our idea of the future of Africa? Um, and that's particular, particularly salient now because Africa is undergoing or has been undergoing this rebranding in the past 15 years or so, 10 to 15 years, right? So from like hopeless Africa to Africa rising or the new Africa or Africa as the future. Um, and so these are the questions that I think about because, and I think it relates to what we'll be talking about and what you've all brought up because for me, um, almost more interesting than this idea of Africa as a future is the question of who gets to be the face of that future Africa? Who gets to represent that? Who is left out of the picture? Because it's wonderful to finally be like, hey, Africa is not you know, just about disease and famine and war and all these things. It's like, hey, Africa actually is about technology. Africa is also about art. Africa is also about, um, I don't know, fashion. It's about all these things that are finally, we're finally being seen in a broader and richer way than we've been seen for so long. At the same time, who is embodying those new visions of the continent? Um, and so those are the questions that I ask in my work. Um, and so I think at some, so this is up there because my research is on wax cloth, um, which is, you know, the African print cloth, Ankara, what you all know. Um, and I'll say two words about this. I won't go through the size, I'll just leave this up here. But these are examples of some of the designs. And so, you know, when I say my work is about the idea of Africa, I look at it also, um, so I, I told you, low tech. I look at textiles, right? Like, I look at the ways that, because this is a textile that we've taken up as Africans and as Afro-diasporic people as a marker of African cultural identity. Um, it's also an object that is not indigenous to Africa, right? It's a textile that was introduced to West Africa in the late 19th century by European mer merchants and manufacturers and a technique that was based on Indonesian textile printing techniques, right? The techniques that were mechanized in Europe and the cloth was manufactured then for West African consumers. Now, over the course of decades, West African consumers have taken this up and made it theirs. And so I consider it mine. You know, as a Togolese woman, this is something that my foremothers appropriated and made theirs, right? Togolese women were really important to the, for the distribution of the cloth throughout West Africa. And so what my research looks at in two words is tracing, um, I'm an anthropologist, so I, look in, I work in the present, so I trace a collection of Dutch wax textiles produced in Holland for West Africa from the design studio in Holland to market in Togo. Um, and so I was looking at the design, the advertising, the selling, um, the buying and the tailoring of the cloth across these two locations to think about the ways that Africanness is being redefined from the design of the cloth itself, like the images that are printed on the cloth, to the ways that it's advertised, what bodies are used to put this forward as a new globally desirable textile, as opposed to a textile just for Africa. Um, and then on the continent, in West Africa and Togo in particular, um, the forms that the cloth is given as dress. And what, I, what I'm interrogating through it is, as the company that manufactures these textiles seeks to remake itself 
from a, tech, from a manufacturer of textiles for Africa into a global luxury and design brand, what transformations happen from the image itself to the way it's put out in the world? So even though I work with a drastically different object um, than what we typically think of as technology, um, my argument and what I hope to contribute to the, con to the um, conversation today is that the questions that we're asking ultimately are relevant across various um, material forms um, and across our you know, very different geographical locations, right? So both on the continent and in the diaspora, we're concerned about what it means to be us um, and the conditions of inclusion in the whole. I think that's ultimately what we're talking about when we're talking about Afrofuturism or African futures. Thank you. I feel this is the right time to highlight my outfit since you brought up fashion. <laughs> you have to, not for me, but to say that um, yeah. you recognize right away, this is Nanowax. This is so, she, because she studies this topic, she knew where I got it. So this outfit I purchased in Benin uh, from one of two designers that are locally there, kind of questioning what has been this traditional uh, flow of bringing in imported, uh, imported materials and, and making things uh, as a tailored ar artifact. This is an outfit that was not tailored for me, which is unusual. It was sold at a store off the rack. And so there's a particular store called NanoX, and she, she knew right away because she studies who exactly is doing this in the region. And I also had a chance to meet another designer who doesn't have her store yet. Um, her name is, uh, actually, if you saw me wearing yesterday, uh, this is a, a designer called Wolan Ilga. So they are asking what the future of textiles and design practices and sales practices should be. And they're experimenting in real time with both the designs, the materials, and even how you sell to people. And so we are just thankful to be watching them make this change and this experiment. So I, I give the credit to Nanowax and to the other designers who are inventing these African features. So thank you. Thank you. This is lovely. Thank you all so much for setting this stage. What we're going to do now, we have a few minutes for our dialogue among ourselves. And by around 12 o'clock, we'll be inviting the audience to ask questions. We have these lovely mics. So for audience, please prepare your questions for the panelists. So you have about you know, 40 minutes to get your questions ready. We have plenty of time to relax this morning together. But I want to now delve into two directions. For a while, we're going to deep, I'll go deeply into Hollywood, because of course, we are partly inspired today because of movies like Plant Panther. But I don't want to get stuck in Hollywood, since Hollywood has, has some limitations on our ability to dialogue. So let's take a few minutes and, and jump into Hollywood, and then we'll also have time for further um, explorations of the kinds of popular culture inputs, things like fashion and books and comics, which we have a few of on stage. So let's do Hollywood first, and then come back. And of course, let me know for both of you whether there's uh, other things to share as we go. So let's talk Hollywood first. And I just have to do, again, the history, because we keep looking forward by looking back, uh, to talk about some of the negative roots that we had to overcome in the beginning of the Hollywood era. I'm fortunate. I mentioned my team. One of my uh, artist students, who's a graduate student, her name is Lisbeth de la Torre. Uh, she's of Mexican-American descent. So she's a trained animator. She went to uh, the Art Center in Pasadena. And she came in to teach us about uh, the fact that early animations and were responding directly to one of the most popular cultural artifacts of the previous era, which was minstrelsy. You guys know what minstrelsy means. <laughs> so minstrelsy was one of the most popular forms of art in the, uh, the turn of the last century. And it's, you know, basically it's, it's live performances mainly on stage, but largely by uh, white actors in blackface who are performing a series of plantation-style skits depicting black people as very unintelligent and as uh, actually with you know, very limited intelligence and with a lot of humor around this topic. Uh, so as, as that uh, form of art was dying out, but animation was coming in, there were so many uh, forms and memes that were basically already in people's minds without even consciously deciding to, a number of things were just transferred directly in. So we see actually, it, it turns out we have to be sad for a moment and, and grieve our innocence, which is that uh, the early characters drawn for Disney, so Mickey Mouse, his friends, Minnie, you notice they all have white gloves. This is not by mistake. They're actually drawing directly from the tradition of minstrelsy. You really could say that they are minstrels. In fact, if you want to go further, there's a whole video online, which is very sad to watch, but it's actually Mickey Mouse and several of his colleagues putting on a performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin, literally in blackface. They actually put blackface makeup on. So we just have to pause and say that we have some of this history to reflect on and to overcome. Of course, also knowing the very first movie was one that really celebrated uh, the KKK legacy. These are just things that are, are known to be true already. It's, that's called Birth of a Nation. So having that as the foundation, we're now going to switch. I, I said we're not going to complain much today. That's all I wanted to say about the negative roles. We now want to switch over and highlight, given that that was where we started, what are now the examples we see of positive tools that I like to use about the idea of appropriation. So this is where we're starting, but we can now take things that are, and then directly reverse them into the positive side. 
Uh, so let's hear uh, a bit from Greg and then from JD. What have you seen to be the overcoming approaches, uh, from examples from Hollywood, where instead of uh, being stuck in this old legacy, we're actually moving forward? Please share about that. So I think <clears throat> the most, for me, the most recent um, example of that is I've had the um, honor and pleasure to uh, supervise all the visual effects for Luke Cage. Uh, so it, it was one of the shows, I've, I've done several Marvel projects over the years. Uh, this particular one, when I was pitching to get the work, uh, was of particular uh, importance to me because, number one, uh, Cheo Coker, uh, Stanford grad, he is the showrunner, uh, and there's just not many black showrunners in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, there are only a handful. One of them, some of you guys know, Saladin Patterson, uh, class of 94, is a showrunner for Lasso Jeep. Um, but the story that it, it was particularly relevant because when the show was coming out, it was, uh, Luke Cage, if, for those that don't know, is uh, a black superhero. He was incarcerated. He received his superpowers while in prison as the result of sort of scientific experiments going awry. And he comes out super strong, and he is pretty much invulnerable. And so uh, Cheo, uh, in his sort of description of what this is, is this is, you know, the world's first bulletproof black man. And this show came out in 2016, where obviously, you know, there were, we were just being bombarded with imagery of police brutality against black people and black men in particular. Uh, and so the notion of uh, this black superhero who could not be killed by any conventional means uh, was, was pretty, um, enticing. And so, uh, generally speaking, in visual effects, there's no black people. I'm the only black visual effects supervisor I know. I've been doing it for 23 years around the world. Uh, I've not met another one. Uh, most of the time when I'm in the room, I'm the only black person, period. Uh, when I'm on the set, I'm the only black person. <laughs> That's just normal. Uh, so, Luke Cage with a black showrunner, black writers, black, black directors, obviously black people in the cast. It's, we called it blackity black. <laughs> <laughs> On set, it was all love, it was family. It was like, all right, you get your cousins together from, from the family reunion, we're gonna make this movie, it's gonna be dope. And it was, and uh, Unfortunately, recently it was just canceled, but I think it'll find new life. But um, this is powerful. Can you also just say but who created the character? So the character uh, was created by Marvel, Stan Lee, and I forget the other guy that created. So it it was born out of um, during the kind of black exploitation era. I believe the comic was started in like 1972. Uh, and if any any of the comic book fans out there know, uh, it was heavily uh, influenced by black exploitation and there was a lot of jive turkeys and sweet Christmas sweet Christmas <laughs> you know so can you comment on what that means meaning what does it mean for a non-black person to create a black character with some sense of a positive view on it but I also see a lot of problematic aspects of because if you look at even Kindy's book he talks about Representations of black people as um, indestructible also make people afraid of the black person, the black body. Therefore, it actually is like, it's making them other than human and, and therefore something that should be fought against. Which I see it as both positive and negative. It has this tension. But how do you reflect on that? Well, I, Marvel, uh, I was a big, big Marvel head growing up since I was a little kid. And one of the things that uh, has been really interesting to me, particularly as, I, as I've worked with Marvel a lot more, is that... Um, Stan Lee and the people and some of the other writers that worked for Marvel, particularly during that era, were surprisingly woke for that time period. Um, and I'll give you an example. 
when they created Black Panther in the 60s, um, you know, the whole notion of this, you know, most wealthiest and uh, wealthiest person on the planet who has superpowers and has a PhD from Oxford and he's a king. And others within Marvel and uh, were like, well, we, we can't sell this comic book because there's no white people in it. <laughs> and so they said, well, you, you have to put some white people in it. And so they said, okay, we'll put some white people in it. And then there's, episode, there's basically issues where Black Panther fights the Klan. Because they wanted white people, so they put him in <laughs> as the bad guy. And this is in the 60s. It's in the 60s. You know, and these are white people writing these stories. And I, when I learned that, I, I was, my mind was blown. Because, you know, they understood, you know, the, some of the social problems of the day and they wanted to do something about it, and they understood the, the power of imagery. And so uh, I, I think, going back to Luke Cage, you know, while you know, it, it reflected that, that, that sort of cinema era of the 70s, I think that underneath, um, they knew that they were kind of being a little subversive, because you just didn't see, I mean, other than Black Panther and Luke Cage, there was no other black superheroes at that time period, you know? Subsequently, X-Men and Storm and so forth came up, but really it was just Black Panther and, and, and Luke Cage, and so they, they understood the, I feel they understood the power of that, and while, and were able to tell stories that were at least the beginning. They weren't perfect, but they were pretty good from a sense of at least they got it out there so that now we can riff on it and, and play with it and create other characters and, and, and tell other stories and we can be involved in that storytelling. So getting back to Luke Cage, that's what was so powerful about it. And anyone who watched the series, I mean, they've, it's extra, extra black. And many, there were many, many times where any of the white people in the room, the writers, they didn't know what they were talking about. They were referencing black Greek organizations. They were giving each other dap. Um, they were referencing things in Harlem that only black people would know that lived in Harlem. And he, that was the point. He really wanted to create this, this sort of world for us, that represented us in this sort of superhero context, so. Thank you for having me. It transitions to an idea that JD and I mentioned earlier in our pre-meeting of, it's about the distribution partly, that because once the story is out and has a distribution channel, then it can have power. Do you wanna add then your, your comments and let us know when you wanna show anything visual? Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Feel free to start wherever you like. I just noticed that connection between the two of you. It's a really good story that I don't want to tell, but I'll tell him later. But it's really good. <laughs> so you're going to. You got to tell him. OK. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this very quickly. But I'm going to tell you this story, and it's going to be real, because it's Sunday morning. So that's how that works. OK. Um, I used to be young, so I was about like 11 years old. My mother was a teacher, so I lived in Kansas City. I'm a little black boy in Kansas City. I watch a lot of Monty Python's Flying Circus, so that's who I was. Um, so when I did well, my mother, I didn't have an allowance. Uh, I got to go to the bookstore, Walden Books. For you kids, it's a place they had books printed on paper. Um, so, so that's what I got to get. So every now and then, my mom would buy me a comic book. So my mother bought me comic books that weren't expensive, because comic books cost 50 cents, and 50 cents was food. So you could get a comic book, and I got one comic book by DC called Superman's Family. Superman's Family was about Superman and all of his friends. Uh, and it was reprints from the 50s, which is why I was so cheap, and it was 100 pages, and my mother thought that was a good value. So <laughs> I was reading that in the backyard, and it's all about Superman and his wife, Lois Lane, and all these other people, and then it had something about his boss. Um, Y'all gonna have to forgive me, but this is a good story. Um, so it's his boss, and his boss uh, works at the newspaper he works at, the Daily Planet, and his boss gets a note saying that his southern um, grandfather didn't make a trip across some desert, and that he was uh, a wimp. 
So he goes, oh, well, <laughs> I'm going to make that trip. So he takes Clark Kent along with him to talk about how brave he was. And he puts on a Confederate hat and he starts across the desert. And Clark Kent tries to save him. He gets some water out of the radiator and purifies it with his heat vision, which can't work because I'm here at MIT, but, you know, it's a deep state. So, <laughs> so Marvel's a science company. Right. So, so, uh, so finally, he takes the water and he hits it out of Clark Kent's hand and said, <laughs> he says, I don't need that. We whites are a superior breed. So, the fact that I'm about to cry and I'm a 52-year-old man and I remember standing in my backyard like that, I didn't see any DC comics, because I was that smart, for 10 years. I'd seen the first Superman movie, that's the last one I saw, including the one with Richard Pryor. Didn't watch that. So, um, cut all DC out. Um, because, and I've, seen, I've bought a copy of the comic later and it's a little bit different, but I was like, wow, that, that was really harsh. And my mother got on the phone from Kansas City to DC Comics, which she looked up. Because we had phone books, it's a book with phone numbers in it. <laughs> Damn it. So uh, my mother called, yes, who do I talk to about Superman comic books? <laughs> I'm my mother's that tall and you don't mess with her. So, um, flash forward, I graduated from Yale and came back home and I told this story a couple of times and I told it uh, to my wife and my wife looked at the book and she goes, oh, this is terrible. Honey, you know his name is Perry White, right? <laughs> I missed that Superman movie with Richard Pryor in it. Flash forward a little bit more. I get to meet the executive head of Marvel Comics, Joe Quesada. He's Cuban. He's following uh, the vision that you talked about, which is that Stan Lee told everybody, look out the window. If that isn't the world in my books, I don't want you here. So if you look at, at Spider-Man's graduation from college in the 60s, he has black kids in his class. So uh, I tell this story to this gentleman thinking he will make fun of me. And he turns to me and he goes, uh, JD, I don't want to make a grown man cry, but I know those old editors of those books, and uh, they left that in on purpose, so mm. I'm sorry. Mm. But that story is great, because sometimes DC people get together with Marvel people, and we're going to tell this every chance we get. <laughs> Hold on, y'all. Flash forward one more time. This is Afrofuturism. You ready for this? I, I, I'm the, I was the boss of this huge group of like 60 people or whatever, and we couldn't give them raises or do anything. So every now and then I walk up to a couple of people and go, you're going to the movies this afternoon. And we take them and I just take them to the movies for no reason, because I'm the boss. So one of the people wanted to go see the Superman movie. And I'm like, oh, old wounds, but I'll go see a Superman movie with you. Oh, Lord. So we go to sit in the Superman movie. And they've all heard all my stories and everything, and we're sitting there and watching the movie, and the stuff, oh, it's terrible, and things get destroyed, it's you know, whatever. And then finally they go, oh, Perry, 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 we need to make the paper, we still have to release the paper. And Perry White comes out, and it's Lawrence Fishburne. <laughs> right. Superior race. So my friend next to me goes, that's you, you did that. <laughs> So I went back and talked to the guy at Marvel and said, I just, um, I just saw a Superman movie. I, I'm not going to be off brand, but Lawrence Fishburne was Perry White. He goes, oh yeah, you did that. <laughs> no. <I'm done>. <laughs> <laughs> That's dope. You see, the problem with black futurism, for me, the person involved in advertising, is distribution. Um, um, I, back, I love that. Distribution is the problem. Um, the first time white people listened to a black man say a lot was this guy, Martin Luther King. His I, had a dream, I Have a Dream speech is my first black futurism text. Because when he said this, the idea of being judged by your character and not the color of your skin was right below flying car. <laughs> right. So that is, for me, the most powerful point. I would, I would like to show one piece of film. Let's do that uh, now. Uh, our, our agency made this movie called The Talk. Um, there's two things about it. Uh, number one, 
they did bring in all the African Americans that were in the agency. And to be honest, that's everybody. Secretaries, people at the mail room, everybody. And we all came in and we looked at it. And the one thing uh, we said, and I'm, I'm a bit of a talky guy, so I spoke up, is that it has to be authentic. And it's, you talk about fooling the eye. This needed to not do that. Mm -hmm. This needed to almost touch the heart in a certain way that was real. Because when we described what the talk was, we all said, oh, and remember that time in uh, Scandal, when he sat down and said, you think you're this and that. And we all knew that. And the gentleman that was directing it was not African American. And he was just, he's the wokest guy in the world. And he goes, I'm sorry, did you all grow up in the same place? <laughs> and I was like, oh, baby, no. <laughs> no, I'm from Kansas. She's from Texas. She's 65. He's 23. He goes, well, how do you all know this? I said, well, when you learned about being a superhero and inheriting the world, this is what we heard. Mm -hmm. Could you play that film, please? Second video, please, thanks. Who said that? The lady at the store. That is not a compliment. Listen, it's an ugly, nasty word, and you are going to hear it. Nothing I can do about that. But you are not going to let that word hurt you. You hear me? There are some people who think you don't deserve the same privileges just because of what you look like. It's not fair. It's not. Remember, you can do anything they can. The difference is you got to work twice as hard and be twice as smart. Come straight home after practice. You got your ID? Yeah. Okay, stop you. How's your review? We're good. You good? Yeah. You see? We're good. Okay. Good. Now, when you get pulled over... Um, I'm a good driver. Okay. Baby, don't worry. This is not about you getting a ticket. This is about you not coming home. I'm gonna be okay. Right? Okay, okay. Baby. It's not fair. But you keep showing up. You are not pretty for a black girl. You are beautiful, period. Okay? Don't ever forget that. For, for me, I, I deal in stories. I love stories, I tell stories, I work with people who are storytellers. For me, Afrofuturism is the story of hope. Now you can use a flying car, you can use textiles, you can use anything, but it's a story of hope because that's the story everybody in this room heard when you're a kid. And I had to tell that to my kid a couple of weeks ago. And she's biracial. Damn. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate the fact of being able to talk here, but I do think that that's, that's the point, is that distributing these stories of hope is that combats that. And every time you get to do this, it's a little bit better than that. Um, and that, that's what's important. I think that Martin Luther King did it. Um, I learned about a gentleman in the 1930s who made a science fiction story that's brilliant from the Harlem Renaissance called um, Black No More. I never knew that that existed. I couldn't even see that. It's called Black No More. Um, and it's from 1934 by George Shiler. And I didn't even know it existed. Um, and then finding out that, well, I know you know this. There was a time when Muhammad Ali fought Superman, y'all. <laughs> it went to a planet with the red sun, so everything was fair. And I don't, I don't want to blow it, but he beat the crap out of Superman. <laughs> <laughs> Muhammad Ali's a Marvel character. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the idea that those stories are more widespread. 
so that you see what happens when the world has a level playing ground. Because um, it's never really going to have one. But, but every little story helps. And watching Luke Cage, man, I watched Luke Cage. It is the blackest thing I've ever seen in my life. Blackity black. It wouldn't get blacker if I turned the TV off. <laughs> it's the blackest thing ever. <laughs> I just had to get in because you inspired me this morning. He, he brought his bag of books. I said, oh, I got to go back home. I forgot to grab my Moon Girl and the Devil Dinosaur. And please tell me what you shared about Moon Girl. Moon Girl is now in the Marvel Universe the smartest character in the Marvel Universe officially. Smarter than Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four. Smarter than uh, Tony Stark. She is the smartest character in the Marvel Universe. So you'll see more stories coming out about her soon. And since we're transitioning, we, we're talking now about different forms. There's distribution through Hollywood, through comic books. And also just, I want to mention the, the traditional book. <laughs> this is one called Ada Twist Scientist. It's just a chance for a child to hear that it's okay to ask why and keep asking why until you find the answer, and that makes you a scientist. So these are all examples of tools we have, and there's more tools now, and all of you have a chance to create the next generation of tools. Is Stephanie Espy still here? Where's Stephanie? Stand up, Stephanie. She is doing her part to add to this with her book called STEM Gems, highlighting real life women in math and science. We all have a role to play, and thank you for playing your role and, and spreading and distributing this message. I want to go back to Professor Ido. Can I actually, so I wanted to extend this, um, the conversation about distribution. Thank you. Because um, when Black Panther came out here, I was really curious, I was here when it came out, and I was really curious about what it would be like to see Black Panther in Africa. So to be in Africa and see it. And I got super lucky because I happened to be in Lome in Togo um, last summer when there was a screening of Black Panther organized. And what's interest, even more interesting is that it was organized in the context of a day-long Afrofuturism conference in Lome. And so I just want to touch on great. how kind of the extensions of these things, because it's, it's complicated. Yeah. Um, where to start? So when I watch Black Panther, in, so Togo is a Francophone country, um, and so when I watch Black Panther in the U.S., I just the accents made me crazy, right? Like and <laughs> because you know, and I, but I appreciated that there were you know these African accents, it's but it was African. a jumble of African accents <laughs> that were all together. You know, so it made me insane while watching the film. Um, I say that because when I went to Lomé, the film was dubbed in French. And so I watched Black Panther in French. It was with accents that are actually from the region, not just... That's and exactly French my point. Regions. Because it was dubbed in French, but it was dubbed in Parisian French. Oh. Now, if you oh. know, I don't know how much you know, but like, you know, accents in French are just like accents in English, right? So they're different African-French accents. Right. Um, and so it was stunning to watch this film with essentially a bunch of what sounded like, you know, white voices right. narrating all, now imagine, imagine watching Black Panther with what sounds like, okay, so I was like, wow, I was mad about the accents in English. <laughs> no, this is a whole other level of crazy. Um, so that, was, so that was the first thing that I just interpolated and I was just like, well, there's too much going on here. But then it got me thinking about, you know, the ongoing, Sort of like politics of distribution, right? Because yes, it's it's great to have, you know Black Panther is a complicated film that does all kinds of complicating th complicated things with blackness and Africanness that are not all positive in my view, but fine. There's something powerful about the representations it offered and everything. Um, now you get that out in the world, you get that into an African um, location like Lomé. It's dubbed in French, but in order to get to Lomé, it has to go through Paris. And it can only get to Lomé through Paris, in fact. In fact, the space where we were watching the film is Lomé's only movie theater, which was donated to Togo by a company that is known to be deeply, deeply involved in a lot of trafficking of arms and drugs. And uh, for decades, throughout West and Central Africa, right? So this is a space in which we're watching this movie that has been dubbed with Parisian accents. And, okay. Um, the event itself was sponsored by the American Embassy and the Goethe Institute, which is a German cultural center. Um, but the idea for this Afrofuturism conference came from a Togolese artist and professor of art who um, is trying to revalorize indigenous, like Togolese ways of knowing, Togolese and African ways of knowing. So to destigmatize, for instance, voodoo religion, um, to destigmatize herbal, like knowledge of herbs and all of that. So it was a day long of panels touching on issues from urbanism to health to um, gender and education and so on. To think, how do we rethink all? How do we rethink our futures, um, starting from what we have here? Right? And so the tagline was, what is your Wakanda? What is your dream? 
So to me, it was an incredibly complex event because at, at once, right, this, the, the fact that Black Panther existed was an opportunity that this man saw that could offer, that could allow him to get the funding that he needed from the US Embassy and the German Cultural Institute to organize this day-long event to bring all these Togolese people together to imagine their own f their futures, right, starting from their own knowledge. At the same time, the place where it's happening is deeply fraught politically. The thing we are watching or listening to is also deeply fraught. Um, and there's no neat, you know, neat kind of ribbon to tie it all together. Um, and, but I share it just to say that, you know, when we think about the distribution, it's not, so distribution, we want to think about the content of films and then, you know, what it does in the world. But then, but then even when you get the film out to places, you know, the, the complexity continues. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a way that we constantly need to balance out in our, you know, assessment of these, of these forms and what they do in the world. Um, the good and like they're, they're always doing, they're very often doing multiple things at once, right? So I don't know what the positive, what the net outcome of the screening was. Because if you think about the psychic effect of never, so of never hearing yourself on screen, for instance, you know, what does it mean that this vision of a future Africa, future Francophone, French speaking Africa, wow. sounds like France? Like, that's wow. a problem. This is, you know, wow. like, language has been so central to the politics of colonization. Right. So, even as we're being offered this vision of, you know, Wakanda. Yeah. Wow. You know what I mean? So, that's a psychic effect. That it's not, you know, so, yeah, anyway, so it's not, you know, the complexity um, just keeps, it just endures. I really value bringing that idea, meaning we don't have to have a simple answer for this was good or bad. Let's actually revel in the complexity and say, here are some things we can say are good. Here are some things that are really challenging us, and let's use that to learn and, and design better. And so I'll come back to you in a minute, because I have a question about that design question. I just want to respond. It reminds me also of the work of Taika Waititi in a different context. You guys know his work? You will in a minute. He's a, he's a director who actually directed it's Thor Ragnarok, right, Jonathan? Yeah. So my husband is the one who yeah. makes sure I have all the popular references correct. <laughs> Wait, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so, but he is actually from the Maori community of New Zealand. So before Marvel invited him to direct this very hilarious Thor movie, uh, he had been making beautiful stories that I consider in the tradition of Zerner Hurston, meaning he told stories about his community. There's one, for example, called Boy, and it's a story about a kid whose dad's in jail. And he has several like, cousins and friends whose dads are in jail. And his dad comes home and they have an adventure together. And the story is told with almost no intervention from out people outside the community. There's one scene where some European, people from European background bike quickly past the boy on bikes, and they don't even see him there, and they're gone. The rest of the story is from his point of view, and it's about his story. And so Taika has been telling those kinds of stories, and I would say in a rebellious way, meaning a way that, that fights against the, the mainstream uh, forces, and is so talented at it that Marvel said, oh, we need you to come help us remake our, our understanding of Thor. So I, I see on one hand, I love his original work in the sense that I learned about his culture from his voice, and then he has a chance to uh, join a larger empire of, of power and sort of see what he can do over there. And it's, it's a complex process to do either one of those things. But I think we can just say, let's reflect on the complexity and then think about how we can do better going forward. And on the side of doing better, I'll start with you and then come back down the panel to say, uh, can you start and then all of you consider this question of, uh, you're here at MIT and we're in this building called the Media Lab. So when we think about Afrofuturism, some of it is storytelling and some of it is inventing. Meaning, people claim in this building to be inventing the things that are gonna be the artifacts of the future. So as a, a scholar of science, technology, and society, what uh, recommendations or reflections do you have about what it means to invent technology uh, in a way that can be anti-racist? I recently wrote a proposal to ask, can I build a satellite that actually embodies anti-racism in it? Meaning, can the materials, the aesthetics, the purpose, the actual functionality, but also the way it exists in the world, in the physical world, can they actually promote anti-racist thinking? I don't know if you know, but when you put a satellite in space, it actually creates risk for other satellite owners. So the fact that the original countries that put satellites in space, in this case, the United States, the Soviet Union, they put a lot of experimental satellites in the early years of the space era, and it means that every country that comes after has the risk of hitting those original satellites until they are deorbited. So the more satellites I put in space, the more that you and you have your satellites in danger of actually uh, being damaged. So there's a sense of the, the physical act of putting something in space as an affront or a violence toward those who are not yet involved with space technology. So I'm asking this question of, as a designer of space technology and of someone who wants to contribute to development, can I actually be Afrofuturist that can help create a better future for people of African descent? And I don't know the answer yet. I mean, I don't know exactly what to do. <laughs> but can you reflect as someone who studies the, the act of scientific and technology activities on this, and as well as your other roles? 
feel like my answer is going to be unsatisfying because well, it's a research I, question, I, so I we don't have the answer yet. More than um, give answers, but I think for me, the starting point for me is always whose categories, right? Whose categories? Whose project? Um, and who? And whose objects, right? Which goes all hand in hand. So, in thinking about what it would mean or what it would take to develop anti-racist technologies, objects, ways of doing, ways of, um, of proceeding. For me, the necessary question is who is involved in this process and whose project is this and where is it located, right? Because an anti-racist project that's located in Lome, Togo may or may not look like an anti-racist project that's coming out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know? Um, and I don't, and of course, I mean, of course, I am deeply committed to the idea of, anti of ending racism and anti-racism. I'm trying to think about the extent to which, you know, do I believe in the idea of like an anti-racist, you know, like in the possibility of an anti-racist object? I, I don't, this is something I'm thinking about because what is the power of the object within this broader structure, right? Um, so I'm not sure that I can, that I fully believe in that, but what I can say is that I think there are ways to, to produce, to work together, to investigate, to ask questions that center, certain, that center people and that approach particular, and we're interested in black people, and so that center folks who've been marginalized, that advance their agendas, that, um, that advance their agendas and their questions, and that, and so for example, super low tech. Tied to this fabric thing, um, there is a technique, a sewing technique in Togo that has been, because Dutch wax is a very valuable textile, um, and so the way that it was, it's sewn for older women, especially often, is meant to kind of reshape the fabric while minimizing the cutting of it for the, for the top, right? So there's like really, really um, kind of simple techniques of multiple stitches that you pull and then it changes the fabric. And the idea is that if you have to, you can undo this and have most of your fabric still be intact, right? Now this is something that's done by women from lower middle class backgrounds, right? So they have everything against them. They're women, lower middle class. Um, they're doing this work with sewing machines. They're working on this fabric that some people see as old fashioned. They're producing things for old ladies. You know, like they have absolutely, they're not recognized as experts and they're not. Yet, I think if we actually took that work seriously, that form of knowing and that form of doing seriously, that could be the beginning of God knows what, right? Because there's a preservationist logic that underlies what they're doing, right? There's a certain idea of value, of not wasting, of, you know, like all these of relationships because the fabric um, denotes, you know, affiliative ties, like among women in particular, but across families in general, and then of course across the nation. So there's a whole complicated, sophisticated logic that goes into this very basic, technique, right? So to me, thinking, so I wouldn't think about it so much as kind of anti-racist, uh, an anti-racist project or technology, but rather to say, can we revalue or interrogate the ways that we value particular forms of knowledge? Because to the extent that we do, when we, re, when we interrogate what we consider to be valuable, a valuable way of knowing or a valuable way of doing, um, we necessarily interrogate the power structures that are, right? So all of a sudden, a, a grandma who's poor can become actually the holder of sophisticated technological knowledge. And all of a sudden, we can orient our attention, our resources to investigating this and to seeing what might come of it, right? So slight shift, but I do think that there's this common um, goal of supporting and investigating and supporting the knowledge that folks have um, who don't necessarily fit the, yeah, who are not mainstream and who are not valued as part of the mainstream. That is powerful, and I think alongside, I hope we also then are creating systems. I mean, from my point of view, Anarch with the United Nations is just asking which countries will have a voice in making key policies around who has activities in space, for example. And so there are mechanisms that make it somewhat uh, uniform across the world, but the question still is like, is everyone having a chance to put input into choices that then influence who's going to operate? Just to give a preview, we're gonna see things quite differently in space in the future. We'll be, we'll be all kinds of companies operating in space and all kinds of businesses that are currently are only earthbound, like manufacturing and banking. They will have a presence physically in space in the future. So now we say in that new era, uh, will these ways of knowing be a part of planning it or will actually will only a few people in the world plan that and shape it? Uh, I'm fighting for the, the more open version, but it's not uh, guaranteed yet. Let's prepare now. So if you have a question, please go ahead and, and start lining up with the two microphones and I'll allow our other two panelists to make some comments to kind of close this session.
Do you also want to show the video? Sure. All right, good. So we'll, we'll transition to Greg's video. You're still invited to sort of start queuing up, and you guys can make your uh, closing comments, including your, your video, as we go. Thank you. So. I was just going to say, so what you're about to see is uh, my, my reel of some of the work that I've done at the company I'm currently working at. I, I started the New York, my company, FuseFX, was started in LA. They hired me to start the New York office um, four years ago. We've grown about 60, 65 people right now. And <coughs> all the work that you're seeing here is work that you know, we pitched and won and, and executed in New York. Uh, it was all sort of my team, so uh, yeah. Thanks so much for bringing that, I appreciate it. So just, I wanted to quickly sort of go back to what you were saying about how to sort of create um, sort of these anti-racist products, things, services, whatever. Thank you. Um, for me, as a filmmaker, I really, from my standpoint, it's, it's about inclusion and making sure that there's people in the room that are creating the ideas that are not homogenous. The end, and empowering them to have a voice. So not just be in the room, but be able to say, no, that doesn't feel right. That's, that doesn't resonate with me. That's racist, because it's, it's, it's making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I know it's not right. 
we know we live in America, we understand, we know, you know implicitly when those microaggressions are happening. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to sort of say in relation to this reel, so <clears throat> I have a pretty um, unique vantage point of sort of running this operation in New York. And while I don't have any black people that work for me, I am the H and I C. And so <laughs> when I when I cut so that reel is a smaller part of a larger reel that we use to get work. I make you know, our company has a large editorial department. They're like, oh we'll cut your reels. I was like, no, I'm gonna cut my reel. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna put Talib Kwali <laughs> underneath it. Mm -hmm. And every reel that I make has hip hop or house or something that shows that we're the New York office and there's some black people there. <laughs> you know? And I think it's, I have, I'm in a position to affect change and I talk about race in my office. I'm, I make, I don't know if I make them uncomfortable, but too well, bad, it's my, words, right? it's my <laughs> office. We're gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk about all these things that are not right when there are opportunities to talk about the stories that are being told and the work that we're doing. I talk about it with my crew because I'm in a position to uh, not just have a voice, but to have a dominant voice mm -hmm. so I can shape the conversation. And I think that's, at least from a filmmaking standpoint, we need more of that. That's why Luke Cage feels the way it does. That's why Black Panther feels the way that it does because people of color are in positions of power and influence that can, that can really uh, change a narrative. I think that's a lovely transition point. Do you mind if we go straight to questions? Are you good? I actually have one. Go one for it. Your turn. Your turn. Um, well, two, two short things. One is the, um, this is a game of inches. Um, and it's still a game of inches. When the gentleman I talked about who was there for 80 years, when he retired, he turned to me and he said, um, I'm sorry. And I was like, for what? He goes, this whole racism thing, I thought I had taken care of it 40 years ago. <laughs> And you wrote an you wrote a email that sounded just like a letter I wrote 40 years ago, and he handed it to me, and it was nearly the exact same thing. And I, I, I felt bad. You don't want to make octogenarians upset like that. So, um, but I talked to my mother, um, and my mother said, you know, um, racism society is about people, and people are organic. So stop thinking of it like a building that you're gonna build and complete and think of it as a garden. You see me out in the garden, you gotta weed and you gotta cut and you gotta prune and you gotta water or it just grows up. You are the next person just to take care of the garden. So don't be depressed that the garden's gonna overgrow, just give it to the next person and they got, it's your garden now, y'all. <laughs> Tired of, these knees ain't good no more to get down. Oh. Um, but that, that to me, that's where you get your, um, that's where you start to see your game of interest. That's where you start to see things changing. And the way technology helps that is by taking every individual person and giving them a broadcast studio. Um, I knew there was racism. Now I can see it. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, young people. We never, we heard the stories in the black newspapers that were across America. We heard the stories at churches. We heard the stories being told of us of our cousins that didn't make it or something. We didn't have to see mm. it at all. Mm. But now that you see it, I hope you don't like it. Mm. And I hope that the least you do is on Tuesday, you spend some time voting for somebody else that does work. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where technology hits it. Um, it doesn't fix the problem, but I'm much more aware of the problem than I used to be. Um, and, and so I, I thank, you, thank you for having this opportunity to even talk about it. Uh, a friend of mine named John Innes, who's an editor at Marvel, wanted to say something to everyone here to say thank you about, about Black Panther and everything. And he went to Joe Quesada and everything to talk about it. And, um, and he wrote, um, for me, the Black Panther has always been about being one step ahead. From his introduction, when he took down the Fantastic Four single-handedly, he did so not through brute force, invulnerability, or special powers, but through cunning, intellect, resources, and planning. Since then, those have been the most powerful tools at his disposal to outmaneuver his foes and protect his people. Technology is a key factor in his ability to stay informed about the rest of the Marvel Universe and make himself an asset 
as he, it also gives him the advantage with weapons and tactical gear that help him deflect bullets, stun opponents, and walk up walls. Before the Black Panther theatrical debut this February, Wakanda existed as this magical what-if world that, while incredible, was too grand to imagine in the real world. But now, as I watch people young and old embrace this character in his world, I think of Wakanda as a space worth protecting no matter how big or small. And whether it be by technological, political, artistic, or other pursuits, we use our own abilities and resources to nurture and protect our space, our Wakanda. We have several people lined up to please give us your questions and we'll just ask all the panelists to please comment if you have something to say. Thank you. Um, I have a granddaughter that is 11 years old, loves math and science. Can you give us a little bit more on resources that um, would be good to encourage young girls and young kids in general to continue to think creatively as opposed to just being consumers of science today? Um, and then the second question is, what did your mother say when you told her Lawrence Fishburne was mad? <laughs> I could just start there. <laughs> she, to be honest, y'all, she goes, oh, honey, I'm so proud of you. And I'm like, girl, I don't know if I did that or not. <laughs> but she said it was important to speak up. So that's what my daughter knows, too. So. And I, I'm sorry, this, this young woman seems to have an amazing resource for 11-year-olds. That's right, Stephanie's answer is one piece. So just to repeat, if those didn't hear, Stephanie Espy, uh, you can go to the mic and, and speak on your book if you like. <laughs> Please hear about Stephanie Espy. <laughs> First, I apologize for the little ones running around, but they are the future. So. <laughs> um, but yes, I'm Stephanie Espy, class of 2001, chemical engineering. Um, course 10 and I actually wrote a book specifically for girls um, fifth grade all the way to high school so that is the target for the book it features 44 different women and 44 different STEM careers um, some of those women are MIT women including my aunt Carol S.B. Wilson including Paula Hammond um, yeah Cynthia Brazil who's a part of the MIT Media Lab um, so quite a few MIT women represented in the book, but I interview all the women to share their stories, share their work, um, encourage and inspire girls to go into STEM careers. Um, you can find it on stemgemsbook.com or you can find it on Amazon, but it be a great Christmas gift for the girls in your life. Um, and it really, it really has a lot of actionable things that girls can do starting today at their current place and age to um, set themselves up for a successful career in STEM as well as introducing them to different careers. Um, and so they'll learn about all types of engineering, all types of science, different t careers in technology, as well as mathematics. So yeah, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. But, um, you know, check it out, stemgemsbook.com. Thanks so much, Jeff. Can I put in the... Oh, STEM Gems. STEM Gems. And then there's a subtitle, How 44 Women Shine in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, and How You Can Too. That's the full title. So, uh, oh, that's happening. Let's hear from Professor Ida as well. I was just going to add, um, as a social scientist, I, 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 I would be remiss not to um, add that it's something that Dean Noble spoke to yesterday also, is that, you know, it's so much, of course, we're at MIT, it's a STEM institution and so on, um, but there's a way that we forget that the humanities and social sciences are actually critical and useful to everyone, including STEM people. And so when the dean was talking about the way that MIT students often approach their humanities, arts, and social science classes as taking their medicine, um, we need to, I think, I, just as important as it is to encourage girls, because girls have been so often, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for, moved, um, Margin. Yeah, sort of, what's the word I want? I'm having a, a blank. But women are uh, discouraged. So <laughs> girls have so often been discouraged from pursuing science and math, right? So of course we have to do this work to say, hey, you can do whatever you want to do, just like boys can do whatever you want to do. But I think we have to be care very careful not to set up this hierarchy between STEM and the humanities and social sciences, because even as an engineer, you need to be out there, you need to be able to write, you need to be able to articulate thoughts, you need to be able to articulate questions. And those are skills. I mean, we're all doing it right now, but you know, just like math, we learn how to add, but it's not just something you pick up on the fly. I think just as we cultivate, in, you know, 
know, in our children and the children in our lives, the, you know, a love for science and math, we also have a responsibility to cultivate a love for reading, for writing, for thinking. And, those, and we learn those in classes, like in anthropology or in literature or in philosophy, right? So also encourage your kids to pursue these disciplines. That's right, and a great example of that is the Hidden Figures book and the story that goes with it, meaning uh, Margot Lee Shetterly is acting as a historian using proper historical techniques to research this topic, present a story to us about black women engineers. So it's not a separate thing, there's, there's both the beauty of history as a discipline, mm -hmm. as well as the amazing story of going to space. So there's both the adult version, but also a children's version that's designed for younger readers. And I'll just mention, I used to work at NASA. If you go to nasa.gov solve, they have a lot of activities where anyone who's online can just access and see ways to get involved with educational or um, they call it crowdsourcing activities where someone who loves math and science can actually respond to ideas that NASA is asking for. Give us ideas for your designs on these different topics. It's a great way to engage uh, students, classrooms, uh, Girl Scout clubs, whoever wants to get involved. Let's go to the next question. We're going to go on this side, please. Uh, we'll go back and forth on the mics. Go ahead. Um, wonderful panel. Um, one of the things that What's so striking about the first slide that you put up, Danielle, was that it, I don't know what the whole phrase is, but the first two words were advancing justice. That's right. And so... That's complex systems using designs and by space, but thank you. <laughs> she said, y'all. Um, but in thinking about Afrofuturism, I'm a social psychologist and sociologist, and a lot of the work that I do is around framing. And as we were watching the video for the talk, and I was listening to the ways that all these black parents are explaining things to them. I was thinking about the framing. Like, that's an important video to be able to see. And yet, in that framing, what still remains invisible is the actions of white supremacist subjects, right? It is still. Some people are going to do certain things because they'll see you versus some people are doing certain things because they're biased, they're prejudiced, they're racist, mm -hmm. they carry these notions. And a big part of my imagination of an Afro future is one in which those actions get named and acknowledged because that privilege is to remain invisible. Yep. And so how do we make visible, how do we shift the frames in the way that we explain things so it's not like the marked category of black folks or the marked category of women are doing the work of having to bear what they get and explain it and do it. When are the folks who are doing those problematic actions named and rendered visible? How can we shift the frame in order to do that? Thanks for the question. Let's hear some responses. Anybody? I would say data. I'd say we're capturing a lot of data right now. Um, and that has never been seen before. And sadly, we've seen people shot in their own cars, we've seen people, where there was always that little bit of doubt, now there's not. Now we're gonna start to process the data. I am not a scientist, I'm an artist. But I would love to see how scientists are gonna start to process this data. The data of seeing something and then saying, oh, well, it doesn't exist. And we, we say things like, oh, there's no facts and people don't care about facts. But as long as there's gravity, there's gonna, you know, if you're not floating off the planet, you're gonna to have to acquiesce to one or two facts. So how is this new data going to be processed? And then, who's gonna write that paper? And then who's gonna present it? And where are they gonna present it to? That's, that's science, guys, that's you guys. You guys are gonna write that paper. And even if the paper's like, don't shoot people, it's so necessary to write that paper. <laughs> But I do some, just have to comment. Data's not new, though. I just, I'm thinking of the legacy of, of Ida B. Wells, who went and traveled around the South after a lot of lynchings happening. She wrote some very clear data-driven reports on lynching. And so data always has, um, it's always somehow filtered by the presenters, just like this was being mentioned earlier. So we had data for a while. We have more data now. <laughs> and now we actually have a problem of how to filter so much data. But we do hope that data helps with part of this. I think it's not going to solve the problem by itself. No, no. Go ahead. I, I, I think the challenge is that, so we have this data, we see um, these acts being committed, and the, I think the problem is, is that in order to really affect some change, there has to be some level of responsibility on the other side that is taken for these acts. And too often, and I, I hear this from not just white colleagues and white friends is, oh, that's an outlier. 
we aren't, we're not actually like that. That's just a, a crazy person. And you know, you hear Trump say this all the time, where it's like, well, you know, when he commit, that's an individual that's doing that. We are not the problem. And of course, we know this is untrue. <laughs> but, but the problem, it's like we can show as many videos as we want. Like, hey, here's racism, here's racism, here's, here's all these people, you know, this, here are all these examples of racism, but until and I don't know how we do this, I don't know how long it takes, four million years, there's, there's, gotta be, there's gotta be some ownership on the other side to say, you know what, I might be racist, even though I have black friends, even though I like Black Panther, I, I, am, I am a white person that lives in a white dominated world, and so intrinsically I have adopted the, the traits of the system. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the data is great, but they got a lot of work to do <laughs> to really bridge the gap. It can't just be us. And just to highlight some next steps on that, um, I dialogue a lot with Ibram Kendi, who wrote the book Stand from the Beginning. He's created an anti racist policy and research center. His idea is to propose concrete policy proposals that can be adopted into the majority system such that people are first reading his next book called How to Be an Anti Racist, and then trying to actually implement policies that aren't just a matter of having a better to data, but actually having new ways of operating at the system level. But this is one, one angle, but thank you for that, that summary. Let's go on this side for the next question. Uh, Kirk Holmes, uh, Class 81. Um, first, I did want to say in response to that, by the way, I agree that with what you just said, but I have a good friend that I went to high school with who has an anti-racism organization up here in Boston. And his point to me, and he's white, and his point to me is that the biggest problem we have is that you know racism is a white problem, not a black problem, and his whole organization is oriented towards that. We don't do workshops for black people; we do workshops for white people. It's, and, and, and and I think to the extent that we collaborate with those kind of folks to help make it happen, that'll make it easier to help them work with their colleagues, and that, that's really the answer, I believe. Um, but anyway, my question is, science fiction becomes science fact, so to what extent do you expect with Black Panther popularity and Luke Cage and all of that, would there be like an exponential impact? And what, what, what would be the social impact of that? Like, might it actually begin to change um, both the viewpoints as well as inspire real real life Wakandas to actually start happening? To what extent might science fiction in that sense start to become science fact um, and the social, uh, social aspects of that? And then the second part of my question is also, does that possibility imply maybe more specific strategies we should have to help encourage that? Just like um, in order to promote STEM, uh, the guy who founded FIRST talks about how he very, it was a very strategic approach to the FIRST program, the robotics program, to bring in popular elements of culture and what young people liked about concerts and competitions to bring it into robotics and make it fun. Does that imply we should be thinking about this Afrofuturism and what Black Panther and, and Luke Cage have created to try to advance that aspect of technology adoption and acceleration, both in black America as well as in Africa. Tell you, we have about six minutes left, so we'll try to give brief responses and get through more questions if we can. Any comments? I, I, think, um, I think if we want to make science fiction fact, I think in this particular case, we have to, it goes, for me it goes back to imagery. I think we have to, our kids have to see other black people doing it. They need to be here. I, I brought my daughter here specifically so she could see all of you amazing people. Welcome, glad you know? you're here. And I think um, if we, once you see it, you start to believe it. And then once you believe it, then anything's possible, mm -hmm. you know? So I talk as frequently as I can to high schoolers because I didn't know anybody in visual effects when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I just knew that I liked comics and art and science. And I liked to draw. And eventually I was course four here. And then I was, you know, it, that sort of pushed me into where I was. And so now I'm making images, which is what I always wanted to make. I just didn't know how to say it or how to do it or how to make money doing it. And it, so I think we have to, we have to, 
we have to show, and then people will believe. Let's take the next question. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm gonna pull this up. Uh, my name is Sultan Sharif. I'm a current graduate student in comparative media studies. Um, soon to be class of 2019, so my degree is Afrofuturist artifact at the moment. Um, I, uh, I want, I'm curious about, uh, have a sort of a challenging, perhaps, question. Um, so I launched a protest uh, here in the building against institutionalized racism. If you currently go on uh, MIT's diversity dashboard and you look up black uh, graduate students in my department, Shaz, it says we're zero percent. Um, and that's still on right now. You can Google it and go there right now. And so my protest was in how MIT represents us, but also how do we like shift the conversation? Because it's great that we can have panels and we can, um, you know, uh, we have regular co conferences and speakers that come in. But then a lot of the students, and I've talked with some of the undergrads in BSU, um, the current BGSA students, where a lot of us are still dealing with some of the same issues that have, that are part of the system. Kind of your comment about the garden, right? And so, how do we, as current students, because I came here because I developed something that I believe will close the achievement gap after teaching in Detroit public schools uh, for 15 years, and then I got here and I was like, I can't even build it because the way that we hold conversations. It's, it's sort of a part of the same system that creates a lot of the problems. So even though I'm in a space with all these amazing people, I've met with Dr. Wood, she was gracious enough to spend time with me, um, and, and lots of other mentors in the space, where I, I'm unable to design something that sort of challenges the space while in a space, even though there are all of these amazing people who are your elders. So my question is sort of for those who are operating within this, because I have a whole Afrofuturist project that I do with uh, youth, and so I'm in this space, I'm presenting the Library of Congress on Thursday, uh, um, but uh, and so you can get recognition, but at the same time, it's like how do we sort of move things forward quicker um, without having to like fight the same battles um, over and over um, and, and leverage sort of the wealth of folks like all of you alumni? How do we how do we as current students who are designing things who are organizing here on campus? How can we more effectively um, sort of get the support or get the uh, benefit from your wisdom and your experiences in the work that we're trying to do today? You. You all are looking at me. Is anyone want to come? That's for you. I think it's for me personally. I mean, I mean, I think that's. I'm also. I'm continuing to think about it, but I, I imagine you have something to say about that directly. I think. I, on one hand, I, I can't give a 30-second answer. It's going to fill yeah, yeah. the ongoing dialogue we're having, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's true that um, it's not fair. Life is currently not fair, meaning this, this system we're currently in, the community and institution we're in now is not fair. So it's still true. And it was, this is the story we heard from Dr. Jackson, which is that she was busy trying to discover important things in physics and had to organize. And we all still bear this double burden, the burden of doing excellent academic work and of being activists or just surviving the uh, aggressions and microaggressions that we're experiencing. It's not fair currently. I don't think it's going to be fair any time in the next few years or months, for which I grieve. Personally, but also, I feel like as a faculty, part of my role is to um, notice when students are experiencing additional injustice and do whatever I can to come between them and the injustice, but um, we, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, I do think we can support each other in terms of, you think, the sort of wartime survival, meaning what do you do when there are bombs dropping, but how do you sort of help each other out? You share information, you share resources, you share food, you share hiding places. You might be in that zone right now. But one thing we can do is to uh, help each other go through. And then also sometimes we have moments where we have victories and we can celebrate those. But it's not fair currently. I can add something. I think I can add something. Um, first, I'm so glad that you're here. And I'm so glad that you are doing this work. And I'm so glad. And yes, I'm sad that you're facing all this. But I'm so glad that you're doing this. Yeah. Um, yesterday, last time, we're having, a couple of us were having a conversation with a former faculty member from when we were undergrads. And she was saying that. One, like when you're trying to do work that's fundamentally challenging the way that things are, right? There's no straight path to get, or no standard path to get there, right? So you're not only do you have this goal and you have to do it all yourself, but you have to figure out how to get yourself there because it hasn't necessarily been done. And that's so hard, right? Um, and when you're in an institution like this, even though there are all the resources, it might, you know, they, like you're saying, they might not necessarily help you get there. But her point to us was that what we have to learn is how to, one, figure it out for ourselves, right? And like, but then know how to leverage the resources that this place has once we are, you know, once we figure out how to get to the work that we want to do. So there's a way that we, I, I think this applies to me and maybe other people, like you assume that in coming here, you'll be able to do it here, you know? And, and 
perhaps there's more possibility at a place like, like MIT than at some other institutions, but oftentimes it's a broader systemic issue that MIT is a part of, right? And so then you're like, okay, darn it, I still have to figure it out by myself. But you will have this, you know, this degree, and then you have the MIT name, and you have all those resources behind you that I do think that you will, I hope that we're all able to leverage that in order to get where we want to go, even if it's not, use, it's not immediately useful to us, or it's, you know, it's not allowing us to get where we're trying to go in the moment. You know, so there's something, I mean, it sounds really calculative and strategic and a little bit icky when you feel like just the mission should be enough to get people on board, like this is important work that needs to happen, like what are we doing here, right? But sadly, things are complicated, and so there's a way that we have to get ourselves there somewhat and then come back and use these resources that we have, and hopefully we can all be resources for each other, you know, as these projects, these Afro-futuristic Afro projects, um, you know, bl blossom, that we can support each other in getting them to the next stage. Thank you. Well, I, Almost I, out of time. But you can make, make it's one quick thing. When you graduate from here, yeah. and you walk, and you leave these halls, hit people over the head with it every chance you get. Mm. I wear my MIT gear on every set I go to. I walk into meetings, I, wear, I have not taken this rat off <laughs> since I earned it, and I, I let them know. I'm gonna affect change because I'm gonna change the way you, whatever you think about black people is about to change today because I know you don't know any black people that went to MIT, but now you do. Yeah. So I'm gonna be in every conversation, you're not gonna talk above my head because you're not smarter than me. <laughs> so let's just get that out of the way. Now, let's, what, are we, what are we talking about? And, you know, in terms of affecting change and making things happen, like, I have changed the, the tone in a room by talking about MIT when I sit down. Mm -hmm. Because to me, to them, I'm a unicorn. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I'm like, no, there's, there's, there's a whole, whole lot of us. Of us. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But that degree, it, I, I owe MIT everything because it's my sword and my shield that I use every day, you know? And even if I'm not necessarily applying anything I, I sort of learned here, even though I, I probably am, just the idea, the image, again, helps to drive the narrative. Mm -hmm. and so they're gonna see a black man with a degree from MIT, they're gonna listen. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't want to, they're like, ah, he's probably really <laughs> smart. <laughs> <laughs> it's real. So I'd like to take one more question from each side. Do I have three more minutes for the one more round, or did? Maybe take another one or two questions, because then we need to move into the next phase. I really appreciate the enthusiasm. All right, I'm going to do two more questions. Let's, do, let's all be as efficient as possible, and we'll have some time afterward. Please go ahead. My name is Robert Newkirk. I'm a Core 16 Air Astro, uh, class 1989. I really appreciate your uh, shirt with the rocket scientists. I too am a rocket scientist, That's right. and I clearly look like one of you. That's right. <laughs> yes. This is what rocket scientists look like, actually. Uh, my career has gone from the Air Force to the CIA uh, to NRO, and uh, I'm the only one there. I'm the only black there, and I, I appreciate your comment about using the brat rat get people to talk, because they really don't want to talk to me. You think it's bad out here going to the classified world inside the Beltway of Washington, D.C. They're so paranoid, it's pathetic. But um, in the process, I also started running an aerospace flight academy, because I noticed folks weren't seeing me and what I was doing. So I decided to do this for high school students in the D.C. area. And there was a census bureau that came out that said that 46% of the students in D Washington, D.C. tested proficient in math and science. And that's the definition is at grade level or grade below. And the grade below was necessary to get it to 46%. There was one school that was actually 9.8%. To make a long story short, what, no, I came to find question, out no. was, what I came to find out was it was exposure. Nobody was being exposed to career opportunities in math and science. So my question to you, and it was, at first it was just to you, Danielle, but now after talking, listening to you three, it might be all of y'all, I mean all of y'all. How do we get the distribution of the media, and as y'all are in the process of shaping this new image of black, that we can get it to the exposure of the young kids. Because all of us have been, got access to the sciences and stuff now here. But out there, it's really lacking. And my thing has been trying to figure out uh, how do you connect the two, the distribution to the exposure for them 
so that they can become, because as an education counselor for MIT, I am so frustrated because there are no ever black candidates that are looking to get into MIT. Because they don't even think there's even a possibility. That's so far up there, you know, they're just trying to get into Bowie State. So uh, I, I'll just keep it at Bulldogs, by the way. <laughs> Bulldogs. Um, I do want to take the last question, and then we'll, we'll respond after hearing the questions. So thank you. But please give us your thoughts briefly. Hello, my name is Ufoma. I'm a grad student here in the Media Lab with Professor Wood. Um, and my question was, I'm kind of on the topic of the data and media. Um, what do you think are the roles of modern day activism with Black Lives Matter and also modern day activist films? Because today it's, I could probably go on Twitter and see a video of someone being shot um, on screen and movies like, uh, recent movies like The Hate You Give are showing this type of trauma against black bodies and I'm not convinced that it's positive for what we're trying to do. So like what are the roles of that type of media in creating anti-racist African and African diasporic futures for ourselves? I, I would say very briefly that if you think about it, a lot of uh, more European-based American uh, futurism is uh, is films where horrible things are happening in this terrible world, like the Hunger Games, right. where all the, all the artists are in one place and all the poor people in jeans in another. Um, they have a lot of these different stories, and, they're, and the sad thing is they're YA novels. These are all the novels that kids are reading, um, and it's this future that is just disaster. Oh, the Walking Dead. When is my day good enough to go home and watch The Walking Dead? It really, so, <laughs> when have I had that day? Ooh, and seven years a slave. That's what we're going to do tonight. So, so um, I'm sorry. I wanted to be quick. But, but no, it's a storytelling. You need to provide context. I do not have your perspective. So I need context from your perspective. I need to have all these stories, but I need a story about just you. Like you said about the stories by Takita... What's his last name? I'm so sorry. Taika Waititi. Uh, Taika Waititi. Thank you. Um, his stories are about one person living in this world. If we had stories from you guys of one person living in this world, not being the person who's beset upon, because that's what rings untrue. It's just you living in this world and how you negotiate from A to B. And then keep going. That's what we need, because people are going to see your stories in Detroit, in Kansas City, in Georgia. And they're going to go, oh, Maybe it's not so bad. I can get from here to there. That's the story. We don't need the big picture. We've got too much of that. We need the heart of it of how you get from here to there. You know how we got from here to there. That's, you've got all these wonderful books and everything to tell you that, and maybe grandparents or someone. But how are you doing it? Because that's going to inspire us. If I can see you make it through a world that I can't bear to look at, that's going to make me braver the next day. That's how you can do it. Thank you. Let's have some closing statements from everyone else as well. Thanks. Um, I'll, I think hopefully this will manage, this will kind of answer both questions. Um, I think, again, going back to imagery, putting images out there that are, that run counter to the normal narrative. Mm -hmm. So if you want, you know, black kids to, to get more interested in math and science, show them all these black mathematicians and scientists that are like doing these wonderful things. I'm, you know, technology I feel is, is, is becoming the great equalizer. So everyone has a computer in their pocket now and they can see whatever videos they want. So are, what are we going to do to make sure that the videos that, that, that show us in a, a more positive light uh, get out there? I, as an example, and this is very sort of trivial, but I'm on Facebook and Instagram all night. All of you all are on my page doing electric slide. Uh, <laughs> because I, said, I, I sent a picture of that room, and I was like, here's a room full of unicorns. Yeah. Hashtag MIT. And then the next Insta story I posted was, and electric slide. Yeah. You know? So for me, it's important because it's like, it's not just smart black people, it's also yeah, we do the lecture slide too. Mm -hmm. like it's the, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's those stories have to get out and we have Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and like I, I, I have a ton of people that follow me and I'm like, you know, if you don't want to see how dope we are, don't follow me. 
And I'm go, but I'm a, I'm a, that's all I'm going to show you is right. I'm dope and all my people are dope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Second that, you can, you can see similar pictures on at space enabled, uh, at space enabled on Instagram from last night's beauty. So thank you. Let's hear your closing comments. Yeah, I'll just echo um, the point about the, the importance of storytelling. Um, and I think I would emphasize um, this earlier point about, about complexity because I think that um, as has been raised, part of Part of how we've been dehumanized as black people is that you know, either we're bad or once we're good, we can only be good in one particular way, <laughs> to put it you know, crudely. And I think what it means to be recognized as fully human is to be recognized as complex and as layered and as many possible things. And so I think along with getting just more stories about black folk out there, we need stories about different kinds of black folks, right? And we have and, you know, and so different kinds of black folks in the absolute, but then also thinking about it geographically um, and even and, and digging into this question of blackness e even because blackness and Africanness is the extent to which blackness and Africanness overlap is not a resolved issue for all, you know, all, all people, right, including African people themselves. Right? And so there's a way that I think opening up to the complexity and committing to the complexity as Part, as a crucial part of the storytelling, the stories that we generate is key to, has to be key to the project of um, fully claiming our humanity, our full humanity. Yeah. That's very powerful. I want to thank you all so much for this dialogue. I want to say thank you to the audience for being so engaged, for spending this relaxed morning with us. We really had a chance to dig deeply. And if you don't mind, I'm going to leave with actually where I started. I read at the beginning, actually, the last lines of the poem by George Moses Horton. Now I'm going to read the first stanza. I feel myself in need of the inspiring strains of ancient lore. My heart to lift, my empty mind to feed, and all the world to explore. Thank you all. I want to uh, thank these panelists for this wonderful experience this morning. Uh, I wanted to say to uh, JD that, that uh, I have, I'm a high school teacher in Chicago. I teach on the South Side, uh, South Side. <laughs> and all of my students are African American. So even in math classes, I have to have a talk with my students. So uh, I will probably be uh, using your video now to discuss what it means to s navigate and survive in a world where we still have to have those discussions that my mother and my father had with me. And also, <laughs> Gregory Anderson, this is not his first time coming to share with Bamet. And I guess it was BAM at 35 maybe, but he came and he shared a demo reel with us and he had the matrix and some other things from Target and all the things that he was doing at that time. And every year I bring that out and I show that to my high school students and they're like, what, what, what? And then I show them his picture. What, what, what? <laughs> so he's been an inspiration and continues to be and will be even more when I can update uh, the demo reel with I hope with what he has here. And I'm just sharing that with them because they recognize the work, but they don't recognize that it's someone that looks like them that uh, is creating it. And then I did want to applaud the statement about students young people needing to be able to read and uh, write, communicate, because um, a lot of times that's not something that's necessarily uh, emphasized as much. No one teaches grammar anymore, so, uh, and no one diagrams a sentence because most people don't know what I'm talking about. But, um, but this is so important, I think, these kind of discussions, because as we talk about distributing this information to, in some sense, a, a world of students that just don't know, uh, it, it is important that we be uh, emissaries into our communities to make that happen. And I do, what, yes, sir. Okay. You're going to do what? 
Oh, okay. I, I, I've heard that one before. Oh, no. Go ahead, oh, sir. No, 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 no. <laughs> Go All ahead. Right. Sorry. I'm Darian Hendricks, class of 89. I actually want to invite the panel to engage in something with me, which would be around space. Um, and I wanted to do a... To, I, I think sometimes when we speak, we sometimes are doing the thing that we say we shouldn't do. So I thought what was very interesting was the conversation about space and your research, but also about the history. And I noticed that there wasn't a connection around asking tribes of Africa, ancient tribes that have history, what do they think of space? What do they know of space? And how does that get included in our research? So that's one thing. And the second is not to dismiss our history of social culture, but to invite our youth and the panel about what does it mean to create culture in space. Um, asking our youth and our, our people, because we talk so much in space about how to go, go to space, get to space, and so forth. And I sit there and I always say, but when we get there, what are we going to do? We want the bars, we want the clubs, we want to make movies, we want to play music and so forth. And nobody's spending time on what, what do you do when you get there? Actually, I am. I, I oh, you I'm are? OK, well, good. And, and this is something that we will handle offline. Yeah, I can take it yeah. offline. Yeah, so we will handle it offline. Oh, okay. Thank you, Darian, for making that statement and asking those questions. Thank you. I did want to say this as we wrap up. There are, there are two people that I want to bring up. One is walking that way. Her name is Elaine Harris, and Elaine was very instrumental in, in pulling this together. So let's thank Elaine. But the other person that I want to bring forward is Renee Harton. She conceived of this idea. And uh, for and, and, and this whole idea of Afrofuturism, she sold this to committee. Um, just starting from a back of the envelope idea and uh, really pull this whole thing together in terms of concept, the panel, what was going to talk about, series of questions, why it was valid, why it was important, why we had to do it. And then, uh, of course, Elaine came on board and the rest of the committee came on board. But when we talk about a uh, future and a futuristic perspective, this was her concept and I wanted to bring that forward. Um, so let me see where we are. So thank you, the panel. We need to go into uh, the next section. So uh, thank you all for sharing with us this morning. <laughs>